Welcome to the Partnernomics Show, where industry thought leaders discuss the hottest topics in partnerships, ecosystems, and innovation. The Partnernomics Show is brought to you by IOLife Solutions, a product incubator specific to Salesforce. Now here's the host of the Partnernomics Show, Mark Brigman. Mr. Jay McBain, it's so good to have you. Thanks for agreeing to be a contributor on the Partnernomic Show. Man, looking forward to having your insights and uh, totally wrapping with you. I always enjoy our conversation, so this will this will definitely be natural. But Jay, uh, for those folks, uh, one or two people across the country that don't know who Jay McBain is or all of the great insights that you provide partnering professionals, I'd love to just start this first episode with you um, as a contributor out to who's, who's Jay McBain? Well, I, uh, I'm a principal analyst for channels, partnerships, alliances, and ecosystems uh, globally for Forrester. Uh, they pay me to connect the dots with uh, what's going on today, what's going on tomorrow, maybe what's going to happen by the end of the decade. Try to put that together in a way. Most people don't have a day job where they can sit around and navel gaze at, at how all this comes together. And I happen to be lucky to have one of those jobs. I've spent close to 28 years in and around channels of all types. And uh, today I have the luxury of talking to thousands of companies of how they're thinking about this future of ecosystems. Awesome. And uh, I'm one of the great recipients, one of many, many tens of thousands of recipients, I think, that, that get to the opportunity to check out your insights. So definitely love what you do and thank you for what you do. Um, I'm going to hit you with a question. Are we ready to fire this stuff up? As a matter of fact, let me get the, uh, the clock going. So in the world of ecosystems, right? So, so EY put out a report fairly recently, just packed full of awesome information. And in there, they said that like the average ecosystem used to be five partners, and now that's grown to seven. Question is, what's that number going to grow to and why? This is an interesting question. I made a prediction a few years ago. And again, for anyone that's lived in the channel for decades, they'll know the terms trusted advisor which is a singular term, it's not plural. They'll know the term single throat to choke. This whole idea of a partner becoming all things to all people to a customer. And we started to see signs of this earlier. And I started to measure it years ago where it's not a single throat to choke. You don't own all 28 moments when that customer has a problem and when they get to vendor, solution, uh, vendor selection, you don't own all those moments. You don't own all the moments during the transaction. And you definitely, in a subscription consumption world, you don't own every 30 days forever. So it was part of Forrester research that we came up with these five partners on average that serve these customers and serve the multiplier. Every dollar of, let's say, a solution, technology solution, kicks out five, six, seven, eight dollars of services. And there's no one company, even the largest of system integrators like Accenture, don't have the skills, don't have the relationships, don't have the backbone to go and serve it all. So it's all this idea of a pie chart where there are partners adding value at every stage, at every level, and customers are looking at this as a team, which ecosystems very much are. I, I kind of made the prediction, end of the trusted advisor, end of the single throat to choke, welcome to ecosystems. Yeah, man, I love that. Uh, it's the, the number is now seven, apparently, uh, for the average. What's that number going to be? Who knows, but it's something bigger than seven. Uh, it's definitely going to grow to be larger, I think, especially as we become more coordinated. I think it's going to take longer, but it's awesome to see all the tech that's coming into the space that allows us to get more coordinated. But as you talk about, you know, the, the, the bifurcation or trifurcation of the channel, uh, there's, there's a lot of opportunities for companies to come in and play and provide value. We're, we're actually measuring. So today it's at seven. I, I, I agree with that number. And how do we get to nine? How do we get to 11? You know, how does the ecosystem grow? Well, we're measuring it by the multiplier. You know, Salesforce, for example, was the first company to ever come, up, come out with a multiplier. And it was $4.14 for every dollar of Salesforce went out to the ecosystem. Software companies, hardware companies, mostly 64% of it was services. Well, that number today is $6.19. It's gone up by 50% in only a few years. And it continues to go up. It'll be $8, it'll be $10 because we're having more to measure inside of that. And do you think that the partners, the seven that are involved today are gonna go just expand their businesses by double or, or 50%? No, there's new ecosystem partnerships that are coming in, in emerging tech, in additional software, last mile solutions. So there's the world's the limit here in terms of 
you know, how many partners make sense in any given customer engagement. Jay, in one of those lanes, do you see this kind of this retention lane, this, re this retention piece being a, a big and growing area, arguably the largest growing area or opportunity? It's not, uh, it is big because every company in every industry is coming out talking about subscription consumption, which creates this change where the point of sale is the first 30 days with the customer. Right. And, and this is pretty shocking because you spend all of your program dollars, your gross to nets, your margins on that point of sale, where now getting the customer to the dance, getting them on the dance floor, which is the point of sale, and now keeping them dancing every 30 days forever, keeping them dancing all night long. Right. All of those are equal in importance. Yeah. Yeah. I can spend all my money on retention, but if I'm not getting any customers to the dance, I have nothing to retain. If I'm not getting them on the dance floor or getting that initial subscription sold, all of these things have equal importance to me. Yeah. But that partner that's working early on to frame up the architecture, the design, the planning, all that may not be the same partner that's doing those deep integrations, driving adoption and stickiness right. and enrichment. So that's why we have seven partners today at the table. Gotcha. All right. Time's up. Let's rock with uh, question two. Fire away. All right. Make question it easy, though. Make innovation. it easy. Make it easy. That's right. <laughs> you know, so we talked about innovation here. It's a huge part of ecosystems. As organizations co-innovate, they're doing value creation. They're building out network effects to build out and expand their solutions. What is the best framework for innovation? Yeah, so people know that uh, I'm a big fan of maps and frameworks and these sorts of things whenever it comes to tactically executing this, this piece of partnerships. But this is an area that I think that companies could do a heck of a lot better job, and that is just the innovation process itself. It's not just simply a whiteboard and some ideas, but how do you do that? The best framework that I've come across is, is the innovators method. And frankly, it was the first one that I saw that was really laid out there is Nathan Furr and a couple of his other uh, collaborators that wrote this book. Um, I think it was his fourth or fifth book that, that came out, but it was basically kind of a take on um, Eric Reese's The Lean Startup. You know, so, so Nathan Furr, PhD from uh, Stanford, and uh, as a matter of fact, the, the creators of Instagram were his students, uh, sold Instagram in 18 months for a billion dollars, right, to Facebook, but they followed his innovator's method, and it's a four-stage, four-step method that I think kind of demystifies innovation, and all this, you know, you definitely know this world better than me, but that is CEOs saying that they have to get much better at innovation, and uh, this is one area that I definitely encourage people to, to check out. Absolutely, so most people don't know that the reason you and I have such a connection is it was over football. And as I was taking my MBA at LSU and Joe Burrow and Chase and others were winning a national championship with the best team ever assembled uh, in college football, that was my alma mater. And I took a course on that startup book. I took a course on the innovators method, the innovators dilemma. I mean, this was right in a very fresh MBA that I took. And I absolutely agree with you. If you overlay the frameworks, the templates, the playbooks, the methods around how you envision customer value creation, how you think about co-innovation through technology alliances. The average customer buys seven layers today, and that's growing. The looking at the strategic and business alliances. By the way, all of these are an umbrella over that customer journey. I said that it's you know the dance, getting them on the dance floor, and then keep keeping them dancing in a subscription model. All of that is overlaid by all of these layers of alliances and co-innovation partners. And innovation just isn't technology. It's services and it's delivery, it's business models. There's all kinds of things going on and we haven't seen anything yet. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I could, not, could not agree more. Okay, ready for the next question? I wanna fire one at you. Let's do so, it. So profitability. And it kind of goes into what you were just talking about. So also in that, in that EY report that I mentioned, right? We've got this profit equation, total revenue, total costs. If we can increase revenue, you know, we're good to go. We're decreasing costs, we're good to go. So in the study that they did, they showed, let's see, what's the numbers? 13.7% of these ecosystems, you know, claimed a boost or a benefit on the, the total annual revenues. And then they also claimed 12.9% in a reduction of costs by participating in these different ecosystems. So in my mind, my, my economist brain gets going. I wonder, uh, ecosystems, 
is there more promise on the revenue side for profitability or more promise on the the cost reduction side for profitability all right let me start with a couple of critiques uh, one is that i thought they took a very narrow approach to measuring this and the author of the report did come out on social media and say they did that on purpose but keep in mind 75 percent of world trade goes indirectly who is in the ecosystem of a car company the car dealership and they're driving 99% of their sales. You know, who's in the ecosystem of a pharmaceutical company? The pharmacy, driving 100% of their sales. So just to start off with 75% of GDP is ecosystem driven today. But they tried to, and I, I think they were thoughtful in doing this, is let's exclude the value added transaction. You know, yes, it's a huge deal getting your customer on the dance floor. And we appreciate it. And obviously, we're spending billions of dollars to, to make that better. Now, let's talk about the non-transacting elements of an ecosystem. We talked about the innovation, tech alliances, strategic business alliances. We talked about getting the customer to the dance through those 28 moments of non-transacting. Affiliates, affinity partners, advocates, ambassadors, all these things that go on to get your customer confident and get them educated so that they make vendor selection in our favor. Think about those partners that show up post-transaction, keeping it a customer for life. So most companies now that have moved into subscription and consumption aren't actually anchored anymore on revenue, profit, and customer set. The world is shifting pretty fast. So when we look at Tesla, when we look at Netflix, when we look at these companies and their annual and quarterly results, none of us pick up what the revenue number is because we don't care. None of us pick up the profit number because in most cases there isn't any. None of us are picking up the customer set or net promoter score. We're only looking at three things in an ecosystem. We're looking at number one, subscribers. Number two, how many new subscribers this period. And number three, the churn rate. So yes, there's a massive cost reduction ability. There's a lower cost to acquire a customer. When marketplaces drive their fees from 20% down to 3%, my cost to acquire a customer just went down by 17% last June. My marketing, my sales, how I build out channels, which has been the promise of channels forever, is to lower my cost to acquire a customer, to lower my cost of goods sold, to you know, lower the cost of you know, product development and other things. So that promise is there, but we're now starting to measure the incremental benefit yeah. that these non-transactional partners give us yeah. in this broader ecosystem view. Yeah. Question for you, kind of a follow-up. Uh, I mean, there's a massive amount of investment dollars that are out there, right? I think you reported there's a billion dollars that came out in our space in the uh, in the in the partnership tech space just in 21. Do you think that that affords this additional, I guess I'll call it a luxury of not really looking just at the you know the the, the profitability from a short-term perspective? because there's dollars in investment that's out there people investors are willing to bet on the long game and, and run a company for i mean look at uber and others right i mean they're they're running a long time in the red do you think that would shift if if there's a you know the market dynamics would put more pressure on trying to become profitable and investors would pull back yeah there's one word is valuation the companies that were really good in the past at driving out you know, strong revenue, great profit, great uh, stock buybacks, and, and playing the market, General Electric, IBM, you know, all the winners of, the, of those decades are now in trouble. Yeah, big from time. Valuation perspective. And now we have these multi-trillion dollar companies yeah. that are ecosystem companies that, yeah, they're driving unbelievable revenue growth or driving, you know, many of them are driving, you know, strong profitability and things like that. But that's, those aren't the things we're watching. We're watching that ability to gain new subscribers, to build the subscriber base, and to reduce the churn rate. Yeah. That's it. So in the world, I'm asking these companies a question now. Why is Microsoft beating AWS? It's not based on technology, and it never has been. No one's ever won a market because they had better technology. It's better marketing, it's better sales, and now it's a better ecosystem. Yeah. Microsoft has an army of 500,000 partners and 400 new ones joining every day that are talking up Microsoft in those critical early 28 moments, and they're keeping that customer Microsoft for life, that's why they're beating a much bigger and technology superior solution today is the ecosystem. Why is their valuation floating up to 3 trillion? Why is Apple floating at 3 trillion? 
It's all about ecosystem. So now they're coming back to these more traditional companies, revenue, profit, customer sat, you know, type of companies, product sales companies, and trying to break them out of that product scale sales and distribution sense and start talking about embedded and white labeled and this broader co-innovation. And that's, you know, to get your valuation from hundreds of billions to a trillion, to get your valuation from, you know, millions to tens of millions if you're raising money. Your, your pitch deck is all about ecosystems. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. All right. Time's up. Next question. Question number four, fire away. All right. Let's wrap it up with negotiation. There One are, of my favorite topics. There are hundreds of thousands, soon to be millions of partners that might be entering any company's ecosystem this decade. Now, this isn't just a simple handshake. We all get going. It comes down to negotiation. Now you're negotiating deals. These partnerships aren't easy. You know, the contracting, the legal, everything else can be lengthy. So do you start by making the first offer, your program offer, whatever it is to this partner, or do you let them come in and frame up what they're looking, actually let the counterpart make the offer? Yeah, man, I love this question. And just uh, there's so much strategy and I think even creativity that, that goes into the whole world of negotiation. And uh, as a matter of fact, we just launched a course uh, in negotiation where we talk about a lot of these different things. But this is one that I have pretty strong feelings about. But there's definitely diverse opinions that are out there. There are some other good resources, uh, you know, where people share their thoughts. But my personal belief is I love to make the first offer. Love to kind of understand the landscape that's out there. I think that's when you can get yourself positioned to put value on the table, but make the first offer. Why is that? Well, the reason not to do it is if you think that there's, there's some chance that your counterpart's going to make an offer that's somehow magically, miraculously going to be close to kind of your side of the fence, you know, kind of your goalpost. In the world that we live in and partnering, we're negotiating with pretty seasoned, pretty advanced people that know what the heck they're doing, the odds of them making a mistake of planting the flag next to you are slim to none. So what, what I like to do just from a strategy perspective is plant the flag, but plant the flag where, where I want it. Plant it in a place that's defensible, that I can absolutely defend. I'm not a big fan of you know just shooting for the moon and then being ready to give a bunch of concessions. You know, my thought is plant the flag, make it credible, but then by planting that flag, now you're kind of forcing them to, to pull that certain term your direction. And you put them in the, the defensive position to then justify that. And if you make a concession there, I believe you have the opportunity to then ask for something in return. Love to get your thoughts. Yeah, I'm going to follow up with a follow-up question and challenge you a little bit. Yeah, let's do it. So I think a third of this industry is going marketplace by the end of the decade, yeah. trillions of dollars, yeah. which by the way, take negotiation out. Yeah. The contracts, the, the whole point of marketplace is to make things simple. Yeah. A couple of clicks away to procure and provision to build these ecosystems is increasingly becoming digital. If you think those 400 new Microsoft partners that join every day are talking to a human, they're not. Click and it's agreement. obvious when you're dealing with a much bigger entity, you know, who's gonna win the negotiation and what you end up signing. But what if you take humans away? The marketplaces need to create negotiation technology where to, and maybe it's automated bots that come to a, uh, an understanding somewhere in the middle, this revenue share, this co-innovation, this value creation, and, and who owns what piece of it. Will that become digital in marketplaces? Will it become digital in partner technology? How do we handle that negotiation in a world that's increasingly digital? Yeah, man, that's a great question and a great point. And the, I think the fact of the matter is uh, partnerships are on a continuum between being very transactional. Hey, I've got a reseller program. Here's my click through agreement. Sign it or don't. Here's my marketplace. Do you want to come in and play? Sign it or don't. And in those cases, absolutely, there's there's huge efficiencies that come in the marketplace. That's that's why it's so booming. So we will definitely see that. But I think there's also the other end of the spectrum, which is either building new products, expanding new products. You mentioned Clayton Christensen earlier, right? The, the jobs to be done, making these bigger easy buttons, doing integrations. Um, I think we're seeing more and more co-creation, co-innovation. Those will, will not ever be totally click through transactional agreements. Those will be negotiated through and out. 
And, and when you involve yourself in those negotiations, they will be human. But without a doubt, this the, the marketplace world is absolutely prime for efficiency. And, and efficiency means you know, not having humans involved. So I think we just created a new category of product called negotiation <laughs> as a service. <laughs> I love it. I think NAS is already taken, but we'll, we'll figure out what the acronym is. We'll come but up here's with the some. deal. There's going to be a million SaaS companies. There's going to be, today, there's 800,000 emerging tech companies, IoT, AI, automation, blockchain, quantum, metaverse, all, all things combined. So going in the future, you're talking about millions on top of millions, on top of millions of partners, on top of millions of companies that are building out these ecosystems. So there's not going to be millions of humans sitting at the intersection of what that co-innovation looks like, what the value creation is quantified as what the revenue share ends up being, there is a negotiation as a service, as a layer outside of marketplace and channel tech that can go in and maybe adjudicate in, in some way what the, the shares are as opposed to these big tech companies. And by the way, governments might come in, the EU and US governments might come in and regulate big tech as they're doing to Apple with Epic, as they're doing with Apple to New York Times, as all these changes are happening. It may be outside of our industry coming in, in terms of how this takes place. So something to watch. And I think there's a billionaire waiting who wants to tackle this. And we're going to, we're going to peel that down into some more questions for, uh, for a future episode. Well, Jay, thank you so much for joining us on the show. It's awesome to always chat with you and get your insights. Thank you so much, sir. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of the Partnernomics Show. Don't forget to subscribe to get the newest episodes at thepartnernomicsshow.com. Special thanks to our sponsors, Iolite. To learn more about Iolite, visit iolitepro.com. And Partnernomics, the science of partnering. To learn more about the suite of Partnernomics courses, coaching programs, and consulting services, visit partnernomics.com. See you on the next episode.